Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Green, and I'm a, an assistant professor. I've been about four years almost out of my PhD. I'm an assistant professor at Western University, formerly called the University of Western Ontario. If anyone's heard of that, we rebranded to Western University, like a good company, any good company should rebrand here and there. Um, <clears throat> I'm an assistant professor in the classics department, so you probably, I don't know, maybe have, have not had too many arts and humanities coming along here. But one of my favorite things about what I do, which I'm an archaeologist, I'm a Roman archaeologist, and one of my favorite things is that it's very, very collaborative. So though I'm in a very, very traditional department of classical studies at, at a university, and that's what I do during the year, during the, no, <laughs> definitely don't do that. Um, during the summer, I spend in uh, northern England up on a site called Vindolanda on Hadrian's Wall. Let's hope that, the, yay, it's working. Um, and in fact, I should point out my colleague that I work with is here, is with me today as well in the back, Alexander Meyer. And we have been working on this excavation since about 2002. We have slotted into a project that has been going on for a very, very long time. It's a, a, the site is called Vindolanda. It's a Roman fort up on Hadrian's Wall. And right now the site is, or has been for about 45 years, um, and, and even longer has it had excavation, but it's been, run, directed, um, and sort of under the, the heritage management of the site has been under the, uh, the site of the Vindolanda Trust. This really amazing group of people, of scholars and archaeologists, who have taken care that this site not only is open for people to come and visit and look at, but also for people to have an excavation experience of their own. So for several decades now, people have been coming to the site, taking part in excavations, and getting a little piece of archaeology themselves. So the director of that program is Dr. Andrew Burley. He's the director of excavations on the site. And then there's a whole slew of people who have been taking care of this site and making it available to so many people in so many ways. I started there uh, with my colleague Alex in the back in 2002, and I've been there ever since in the summers through my PhD, and then now that I'm a professor, I'm bringing my own students there. So it's been a site that has really been something amazing for a lot of people. So like I was saying though, one of my favorite things about being an archeologist is that I collaborate with tons of people. So we're running from everything from arts and humanities, which is where I came from in fact, with a degree in classical studies, just really super interested when I was 18 in the Romans, wanted to learn more about the Romans and the Greeks, and then somehow made it all the way to archeology. span But what I'm doing consistently is collaborating with scientists and tech people and all sorts of individuals in the field. And this is really one of my favorite things about being an archeologist. Now, do we have any sort of secret classics majors or archaeology majors or anthro majors in the room? Not a si Oh, we do. History. History. Okay, fantastic. What did you guys do? I was, I was a classics major. You were a classics major? High five. Right on. <laughs> That's fantastic. So was I. <laughs> um, so I came through it really through the cultural world. Uh, you know, just interested in these people, and then came all the way to archaeology. So now my world is opened up to all these different people. Okay, so for the people who aren't classics majors in here, let me just tell you a little bit about the site and about Roman Britain and, and for where we're talking about, give you some context. The map that you're looking at is indeed a map of the Roman Empire. And this is one of the first things that got me thoroughly interested was, wow, that's huge. The, the, the Roman Empire now covers 42 modern countries. So this is really amazing as far as I was concerned. Um, when you look at it now, where you see our work taking place is all the way up on, and I'll just use this because I can't point at all the screens, all the way up here, literally on the northwest, the furthest northwest corner of this Roman Empire that you could possibly be. So really, really far from the center of Rome. And you can imagine with that comes all sorts of interesting things like what is it like to live on a frontier? What is it like to live in a conquered zone? There's all sorts of questions we could ask. What I'm gonna tell you about today though is a little bit of how we come to some of those questions, how we discover some of those questions. So there we are all the way up in that northwest corner. The site is really famous for a couple of things. It has some really unique preservation called anaerobic preservation. You guys probably all know what that is. It doesn't have any oxygen in the soil. Therefore, we have finds that we don't really get in most archeological environments, organic finds, leather, wood, things like that. The site actually has, this is something that's close to my heart, it has over 4,000 Roman leather shoes. And people ask me all the time, well, why? You know, is this, a, is this a shoe production site? No, not at all. It's just because we have this anaerobic preservation. 
Um, but you might not have ever thought we have shoes from the Roman world. We do indeed. But this site has absolutely the largest. That's one thing it's very well known for. Um, has anybody ever been up here to Hadrian's Wall or been to Vindolanda? All right. Fantastic. Good. So we have some people. If you go there now, you'll be the first thing you see in the museum is you stare at a wall of shoes. It's really quite amazing. And they're nearly 2,000 years old. The other thing the site is very famous for are these things called the Vindolanda writing tablets. Ink on wood, direct messages, letters, personal letters, um, duty rosters from the Roman army who inhabited this site. Um, what else? There's uh, personal sort of postcards. What you're looking at here is probably the earliest female handwriting from Europe. There's a little private message in this letter. Most of it is a scribe right here. This little private message right there, it's a letter between two wives. And one wife says to the other, two uh, military wives, they're, they're wives of the commanders. And one wife says, oh, please, please come to my birthday party. This day would be so much better if you were here. Really quite of amazing. Nearly 2,000 years later, you're thinking, oh, the first letter they actually found said, I'm sending you socks and underwear. So <laughs> you can imagine everything from socks and underwear to telling us exactly what these individuals are doing on site. So this is, this is another category why this site is very famous. There's all sorts of really unique and interesting things there. Everybody should go visit when you get to England. Um, but what I want to do today, rather than just sort of take you through some cool finds from the site where I work, is to tell you about an archaeological trench and what happens to an archaeological trench from sort of beginning to end and how we are collaborating with all these different people. Because in the end, we're looking for very small things, but it has to start much, much, much bigger. Has anybody been on an archaeological excavation? You think Kate? Excellent. Three people. That's really cool. Um, so I want to talk to you about that sort of life cycle of the trench. Yes, question? Uh, I would expect at least to be able to identify the words here, but it looks like there's no vowels or something. Right, right. Well, uh, there are vowels. What you're looking at is Latin cursive. So it is an early, have you ever seen a medieval <laughs> manuscript? It's, this is a very, very early script from the Romans, from sort of when did they start using this? Probably, um, when's our earliest, Alex, for cursive, Latin it's cursive? Like when you print in block capitals. Like yes, so on an inscription, yeah. If who's been in a museum and seen an inscription, you know, with uh, lots of you, right? And, and you see these nice block capitals. And in fact, we recognize that from kindergarten as well, learning these nice block capitals. This is something totally different, but it is, in fact, Latin. But it's an interesting story. When they first found these, the excavator, uh, Robin Burley, who directed the site for a very, very long time, he looked at it and thought, is this a different language? You know, what am I looking at? Um, but in fact, when you, when you start looking at it, it's Latin cursive. We have other media that have this. Um, a lot of large, large kiln sites, you'll see orders written out on ceramics in this cursive. So we have a lot of cursive. Papyri, we see, we get Latin cursive as well. Um, it is just difficult to read, but once you understand what it looks like, it's just Latin. Cool, huh? So I want to start you understanding how, going through this site and how we start an excavation and what we go through and then where we end up. How do we get this data? Where do we, what kinds of questions are we asking? So we start, one of the other things I love about Roman archaeology or just archaeology in general is that really it's big data put together with small data. We're looking to answer big questions, but we have to put together a lot of small stuff, a lot of little bitty stuff. What you're looking at here on Google Earth, obviously, is an image of the landscape very, very close to Vindolanda. It's just north of the site. The site is very close to Hadrian's Wall. So what you can see here are a couple of different things. I think that the, the, the things that are so prominent to me are this right here. You've got something right here. And you've got something, I think the most prominent thing is this right here. What you can really see is the late Carboniferous period. You can see the Romans. And then you can see the 20th century. So you can see three different things. The, you're looking at what's called the windsill crag right here. And Hadrian's Wall built right on top of that. Hadrian's Wall is this enormous wall, 15 feet high, 89 feet long, that the Emperor Hadrian built in the 120s. He needed to consolidate. He wanted the empire to be sort of closed off a little bit more than it was. He wanted to protect it from non-Roman lands. So he took the opportunity with this enormous, literally from the Carboniferous period, geological formation that runs almost across the whole country, mostly in the center, and he built a great big wall right on top of it. So you're seeing the shadow of that right there. But in fact, the other thing that you see in this picture is something that was dug by the Romans. Now, when I ask my students this, what do you think this is? Most of them think it's a rail line, something like that. Indeed not. That is an enormous ditch that was built, dug by the Romans in order to protect Hadrian's Wall and in order to protect this um, 
military zone that they created with Hadrian's Wall. So when you look at this, you can see the only other most prominent thing is, is this right here, which is a 20th century quarry. And really, you can only see it because it's filled in with water. But all through the landscape, you have the Romans. You have this. You have Hadrian's Wall here. You have this giant ditch called the Vallum. And all of these little bits down here are also telling us things about the Roman period, in fact. They're, those are small um, uh, marching camps and little enclosures and things like that that actually most of them date to the Roman period. So we take this big data. And we have to combine it with these questions and ask ourselves how we're going to come down onto something else, to, to, to some sort of final answers. And the other thing to point out, though, is that we can't get rid of some of our old data. We have much more refined stuff sometimes, even from the 1970s. So what you're looking at here is an aerial photograph of Vindolanda from somewhere in the mid-70s when they had a, they had, there, there's two things that work for really well for um, aerial photography, that is, a drought, one thing, and a little light dusting of snow is the other thing. Because you get nice contrast. You either get dead grass during a drought where you have things underneath. Um, or a light dusting of snow gives you really great contrast. So if we go diving into the Vindolanda archives, the archives of the Vindolanda Trust, we find things like this, which is really what I would kind of consider, though it's showing us something large, sort of a small data. We don't want to forget about these old pieces of information that we have. We want to bring this all together in order to decide where it is that we want to excavate to answer some of our questions. So I'll draw your attention on this. You're looking at the fort. Um, so it's that same fort as the aerial photography that I showed you before, the green one. And you've got the, the, this structure right in the middle here. That was the only thing excavated back then, except for some of the gates and things like that. I'll draw your attention into two different areas, and that is this right here to the west of the fort, and then this area to the sort of northwest. We call that the north field, and that's actually where I'm going to be concentrating today to show you what we've been doing recently on the excavations there and, and how we're, we're answering some of our questions. If you look at Vindolanda today, what you see is that extramural settlement right there. That is, in fact, that first square just to the west that I showed you. So we're I've shifted you again. We're facing a different direction. We're sort of looking northeast now. But when you look at all of those lumps and bumps in that last image there, and you say to yourself, gee, we may have something in there. There might be something underneath the ground there. You then do an excavation, and that is indeed what you find. You have buildings, and those buildings are populated with all sorts of artifacts that are going to tell us a lot about what's happening um, it, on this archaeological site. If you walk around the site today, this is what it looks like now. This is, this is the, the site that you will see. And by the way, it's a fantastic visit if you're in northern England, a great place to go. So I'll draw your attention back to that field right there. We also identified in some of these older pictures and then combining it with things like Google Earth, uh, we've identified that there might be something happening over there as well. We've got this large line going across here. And in other photographs, we see a, a nice little corner right there that we thought might be the corner of a fort. OK, so what do we do next? Nowadays, we will do some geophysical survey. Um, has anybody in the room ever seen Time Team? Yeah? Oh, good. So a couple of people. Um, the reason I ask is because nobody used to know what geophysical survey is. You guys have probably heard of it in science classes and things like this. But nobody used to know. But now that Time Team is out there and everybody can watch shows about archaeology, we have the tourists that come up to the edge and they're very, very educated and they say, excuse me, have you done your geophysical survey on this area yet? And of course, we say, yes, indeed we have. But it's really great that people actually, sort of regular people on the street are, are understanding a lot of this more often now. We do geophysical survey of some sort. What we have done on the site is called the magnetometer survey. Uh, you could also do resistivity. You could do ground penetrating radar, which all sort of measure different things in the subsoil. What the magnetometer survey is doing is measuring the magnetic field. It's basically giving you anomalies, positive and negative anomalies, based on the magnetic field below. So it's not exactly, you know, like 3D vision, but it's telling us what's down there. It sometimes works very well. It sometimes doesn't work very well. You're looking at a grayscale plot, which doesn't do very much for us right now. What that needs to do is be rendered and interpreted into something more. So what you have is negative anomalies. All of these little gray bits here, these are neg negative anomalies. And those are usually uh, stone buildings, things like this. Um, and, and by the way, I should point out that this isn't something we don't pull out our own magnetometer survey. This is one of those collaborations. We have a team come in, do the survey. We use uh, right here Timescape Archaeological Surveys in Northern England. 
they do the survey, they put this together. So this is one of those instances where I get to talk to all sorts of interesting people and, and kind of walk along the field with them and, and talk to them about what they're doing. And then they send me this, this material back. We also have positive anomalies, just to get back to this. Those are those dark ones there. Uh, some positive, though rather vague, which are these sort of dotted ones. And what I'll draw your attention to is this right here and some of these very, very strong, uh, they're called bipolar or, or vi they're very magnetic reactions that we get. And this is, in fact, something we were interested in right here. And you can even really see that well on the, the grayscale plot as well. So what we've got here is an idea of what is underneath the ground. We want to know if we're looking at potentially ditches, if we're looking at stone buildings. It's worth pointing out, though, that this does not always work, because I have myself excavated several stone buildings in that field that didn't turn up on any of these plots. Now, ours is about 10 years old at this point, and this summer we're going to do more GPR or more geophysics of some sort. And that's, you know, this is the sort of thing that is changing all the time and becoming um, better and better and better. So we will do more of this later. Um, I will also say, though, that, so like I said, we can't forget about the old techniques. We also will marry this and get more information. We'll put all of this together to get information off of a classic earthwork survey. So this is in 2010, I believe this one was done. And that will be done with a total station. So they're out there, they're surveying, you know, proper survey. You guys have seen the road work crews who are out there with total stations and such. But I should say that this is the same exact thing that could have been done 50 years ago with a dumpy level. And it's almost the same exact thing. It wouldn't have been as precise by any means. It's almost the same exact thing that, you know, William Roy could have been out there 200 years ago. He's the guy that, that, that started up the idea of the Ordnance Survey in England with a theodolite that long ago. And it's worth noting that the Romans were doing very, very similar things with a groma, a tool called a groma, where they just, that's how they got those straight lines and those straight ditches. And they knew how to survey as well. So really, really interesting. But we have to remember that these things, these, this kind of information is giving us really great data as well, because it's telling us what's happening on the surface, which could very much have everything to do with what's happening down below. So kind of return yourself to your fourth grade, learning how to read like a topo map. Um, these are telling us that, that this is a very, these little arrow things are telling us that there's a very steep you know, hill right here. And what we came up with was this really nice corner here that looks like something we're quite interested in. Back in 2010, we had dropped a trench right here, and you can just see the outline of it. And we got the very, very corner of this red feature. These are fort ditches. They're defensive ditches. And we realize that if we have defensive ditches out here, then we probably also have a fort out there. So what we're, what we're looking at is potentially some of the earliest buildings on site, some of the earliest occupation on this site, which might really change the way we see the frontier. So if you're kind of wondering, well, what's the big picture here? What are we looking for? This might change the way we actually view the frontier at this point in time. Because if we have occupation here 10 or 15 years earlier, that might really make a difference in how we see the occupation by the Romans um, and the consolidation of this frontier. So we use our classic earthwork, earthwork survey as well. Now I threw this in here because a lot of people ask us, why do we not use metal detectors? Why are we not just out there with metal detectors? And there's a couple of reasons why we don't use metal detectors. One, this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is a scheduled, or I should say scheduled monument in England. And on sites like this, you do not, uh, you, you cannot have metal detectors. They're, they're not allowed. They're illegal on, on site. Now, we could probably uh, put in a permit. We could ask for a permit from English Heritage, who's the overseeing government overseeing body, and we could use the metal detector if we wanted. But what we like to do with, we want to put out a vision to the public that metal detectors are not necessary for us. And one of those reasons is that when people go out there with metal detectors and they just do this, and then they find something, and they dig down, they pull something right out of its archaeological context. Whether you go down a foot or you go down three feet, you pull it right out, and we have no information about what's behind this, there, around, underneath, above, nothing about the, the context, the stratigraphic unit, I should say, of this, ar this uh, artifact. So that's a very big problem. But also, it is prioritizing metal. Before, we looked at some really interesting leather shoes that are telling us about the kinds of people that are living here on site. We looked at wooden uh, writing tablets that are telling us a lot of information about what they're doing on site, who they are, what they're thinking about, what they're working on. None of those will be found with a metal detector. So we, we really have to remember that 
archaeology is bringing lots of information together, none of which can be done with just sort of one piece of, of equipment. And metal detectors really just don't do anything for us in that sense. So a lot of people ask me that, uh, so I wanted to put in a little bit. So all right, how do we pick our spot? We're going we're gonna to go in there. We're going to excavate. What do we do now? I asked you to look at that area right there on the magnetometer survey. And in fact, that is where we decided to start digging because we had questions. There was a potential that this might be a kiln because this is one of those bipolar, one of those intensely magnetic, as you can see in the key there, one of those intensely magnetic anomalies. And those are often associated with kilns, with the very high ferrous, the burnt material that you find around kilns. So we decided to go right into that spot. And as you can see there, we started the trench. We peeled away the, the um, ground surface, the, the, the plow zone, we often call it, because this area has been affected by agricultural working for hundreds of years. That was the trench in 2012, and we also dropped a trench very nearby in 2013 and 14. We get in there pretty quickly, peel off all of that top level, and what are we looking for? Basically, archaeology, when you are just starting out, you're looking for changes in the soil. And some of you might be able to make out that right through here, we have a, a sort of dark curve running through here. We have a dark kind of splat, we can call it maybe, right here. We have a slightly lighter area right here. And then also just over here, we have something that's bright orange. I'll draw your attention to that. And in case you can't see any of that, I've circled it for you <laughs> and made squares. Now, one of the other problems with the magnetometer survey, and again, how I'm saying that we really have to bring together different techniques. We can't just use sort of our, our science and say, OK, um, let's just peek under the ground and we'll see what's there, because that's not telling us the whole story. And in fact, it's not even really telling us you know, 50% of the story. Because what it's giving us are readings. And we have no idea if those readings are from the Roman period, or I could go all the way back to the Bronze Age for that matter, whether they're from the Iron Age or the Roman period or the medieval period or the Victorian period or for that matter 50 years ago. And indeed, this little, actually quite large and quite a, an annoyance inside of my trench, this is a very, very large Victorian drain. So this field was used in the 19th century as a, um, for, for grazing animals. It was very wet, very mucky. And they did all sorts of things to attempt to, to drain that field. And that is indeed what that is. That is a drain that I will record, of course, and you know, take a look at. But we kind of want to go through pretty quickly. It was very much in the way. It's still running, in fact. still worked quite well. This over here turned out to be a pit, a, a Roman period pit. So you can have you know, things of different, ty of different um, time periods right next to each other. This is also a Roman period pit. But I'll, I'll draw your attention into this red square right here and that orange little kind of rectilinear feature right there. Hopefully it's coming up on the screen. In the interest of time, I'm just going to show you exactly what that was. Boom. That was a kiln. So once we excavated from you know, top down to bottom, we do this um, strat what we call stratigraphically. We, we dig down in stratigraphic units, recording each one as we go so we understand how the archaeological site was built up, and then therefore how we're essentially pulling it down. Because archaeology ultimately is destructive. We have to record it in such a way because we're not going to get it back once we, once we excavate everything. So you're looking at what turned out to be a kiln. Now one thing I'll point out is that the very first um, sort of inkling of this kiln being here was just that over there. That is that little orange rectilinear area. And what we end up with, once we excavate everything from 2012, uh, well, actually, this is the 2013-14 trench. After two years, we end up with this enormous kiln foundation right here and a secondary kiln over here. So this is a really large complex where they were making brick, tile. The material that came out suggested they're making brick and tile. But then we found material suggesting they're making actually quite nicer things. There was a mold for maybe a small um, figurine type of thing or something that was maybe put onto, um, put onto a, a, a vessel of some sort. Uh, and we also found pottery, what we call pottery wasters. We found the, the offshoots, basically, the, the remnants of um, pottery that misfired or something like that, you know, and they just chuck it off into the ground. So really interesting stuff coming out of here. But this leaves us with a number of questions. When we find a feature like this, we're wondering a whole number of things. Um, one, I'm always going back to the magnetometer survey, and I'm saying, OK, that really did not, 
that whole thing is there, but there's no indication that uh, what any of that is. So just another reminder that we still need to always get out there with our trowels, with our spades, and, and, and excavate these areas that, that we thought looked interesting on the magnetometer survey. So some of the questions that we're asking once we find a feature like this is when was the complex active, we'd like to know. We want to know what was produced here. We want to know how it was produced, what kind of production they're using. We want to know where these final products were used. So one of the big questions we're always asking in archaeology is, you know, what is the scope of this site? Do we have this material moving um, just onto the main site of Vindolanda? Is it moving out onto the frontier? Is it moving out of Britain even? We want to know all of these things. Um, and then, you know, how, uh, how much impact did this site actually have on its surroundings? So the first couple of things are easy, and you guys have probably all heard of radiocarbon dating. We now combine radiocarbon with accelerated mass spectrometry dating as well. And the great thing about that, with traditional radiocarbon dating, you need quite a large sample of carbon, of, of, of some sort of burnt material. With AMS dating, you really only need um, a very small amount, maybe even one gram, I think they can get some, some information from. So that's really, really useful. However, there are problems with, with any kind of C14. And that is that we get these windows with carbon-14 that could be as large as, as mine was, um, 80 AD to 230 AD. And in fact, <laughs> that is, as Kate knows, that is almost the lifespan of the site. We know these Roman periods. We know that the, the place was occupied well into the 5th and 6th centuries. But in terms of sort of the intense Roman activity, that right now we have started at about 85. Um, if we can push the, the date of the site back a little bit, if, or, or up a little bit really into the 70s, that would be handy. But 80 doesn't give me too much great information. And then all the way to 230. And the probabilities go down, 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 down if you want to hem that in. So you can say, well, it might have dated to about 160, but that's only with um, you know, a 60% probability. So that's a bit of a shame with radiocarbon. That's why we don't actually use it very much. Radiocarbon goes back 50,000 years. It's good for, um, you know, things that are 5,000 and 10,000 and more years old. But when you're in a very uh, historical period where, in fact, you have the potential to find things that, you know, say, um, this stone was carved in 113 AD in the month of October, you know, it doesn't uh, really help you out quite as much. Now, we don't have any precise dating like that yet. We don't have any inscriptions from our little kiln area out there. Um, but we will, we will at some point. So there, is, there are a few problems there. There's some very cool stuff, though, going on. There's this thing called archaeomagnetic dating that you can do in something like a kiln that has been burnt, has been fired over and over and, again, over, and over again. And this takes um, the, the magnetic direction of the soil when it was last fired. So it could actually tell us not when it w began to be used, when it was first used, but when it was last fired. You take these samples of the soil, you have to mark the true north on it, and then you send it off to a lab. So again, this is not something that I personally then, you know, walk into the next room and start looking at. You send it off to the lab that works on archaeomagnetic dating, and they could give you a fairly reasonable time span. Um, sometimes, if you're lucky, same with dendrochronological dating. So, do, you, do you guys know dendro, where you, you read the time rings, or the tree rings, rather? Um, you, you hope you have a good sample, and it's going to tell you at where magnetic, where the Earth's, Earth's magnetism was at the time of last firing. Now, one problem for England, we don't actually have the baseline data yet, that you need to have these curves where you have all of the baseline data and then you plug it in. So very much like dendrochronological dating, where you are plugging your tree ring sequence into known sequences, we don't have the data yet fully for Northern England or for England at all. So it, they're building it up. And actually, we're hoping to be a part of that with this kind of dating. But we, the, the best ones, the best baseline data is for the Southwest uh, in the States, Southeast in the States, and actually in the Mid-Continent. So I'll entirely within the state. So it's getting there, though, and that's one of those things. It is, was developed, I think, in about 1992. Takes a couple of decades to really get this going. So it's not, we're not quite there yet for our kiln, but hopefully we can be a part of it. We might be able to get something off of it. Might be able to get a fairly um, decent date off of that. So what and where? The questions that we asked that are really more, I'd say, um, the, the cultural side of me is saying, ooh, you know, how are we going to discover 
what and where, what is being produced there and where is it going? This is something that I really want to know. So how do we analyze ceramics from these kiln, from kiln production? We do a couple of different things. Um, throughout the excavation you find any number of, of, of bits of ceramic. You're looking here at uh, the mouth of a, of a large jug of some sort. You're looking at some of the body shards, but then also around here there are bits of brick, tile, all sorts. And what we end up with really Anyone who's been on an excavation will remember this. You end up with gobs and gobs and gobs of pottery, just bags and bags and bags. And they're all labeled with the, the right context. So you've got all these different numbers everywhere. And you then take all this and you analyze uh, what the pottery is made out of, how many do you have of this type and that type. Um, and they all, if you've got a nice sequence of styles, then it's going to tell you a, a rough date, a sort of seriated date for, for that type of pottery. But what we can do here with the kiln, because what we really want to know, we want to create baseline data with the kiln to know what is being produced there. So we pull out what we know is called a, a waster from this kiln. And, and so like I said before, you get all of these sort of, these are basically factory seconds. So if you go to a pottery today, you've got a shelf that has all this sort of, you know, junky stuff that was misfired or something and you can buy it for a dollar. They don't have the shelves, they just chuck them off into these pits. So around a kiln, we find a series of large pits that are full of ash, full of the refuse from, from, kiln, from ceramic production, from the kiln, and then also a whole bunch of bad pots and bad tiles, bad bricks. So what you get are um, things that have, let's say, an uneven surface, uh, excuse me, an uneven surface that would not have been good for walking on for actually using. Maybe a pot that uh, was misfired, so it wasn't fired to high enough temperature, so it's very friable, uh, or something that maybe sunk in. So you find these. And we can use these for, these are really nice too because we don't want to put them in the museum, right? So if somebody wants to take them and cut them up and, you know, put them through mass spec or do whatever, then that, that's quite all right. So we send these off and we do something called ceramic petrography. It's sometimes also called ceramic petrology, either one. And we get these thin sections. Now again, this is a technique that's been around for quite a while. Now, I don't have my thin sections yet from 2014. So what you're actually staring at is a lunar thin section, just so that I... Um, didn't confuse you with any earthly stone. This is, um, this is from the moon. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, isn't it? So what it's doing is once it gets a very, very, you get a very thin section of, of the stone or the ceramic or whatever it is you're looking at, it goes on to a, a slide. You look at it under, the, under the, the microscope and you can see exactly what is making up that local geology, that local clay. So we also will test the local ground clay and see if they're using that local ground clay. And then you get baseline data as to what your local production looks like. And then what we need to do is convince everybody around us, convince all these other sites, OK, what we'd really like is for you to uh, give us samples so that we can um, understand if our material is going over to your site, going over to Corbridge or down the road to the other military forts. If we can convince a lot of people, then we can say, great, uh, maybe we can see if our material is going off of the island, or is it going down to London, something like this. So it's, so it's really interesting questions that could be asked. Um, and we do all this through sort of simple things like ceramic petrography. Yeah? It seems you can do a little math. You probably know how many bricks they could produce an hour. Yes, yes. Actually, in fact, this afternoon I'm meeting with a, with a colleague in New York who does a lot of that. Um, she's over at the New York, uh, I think, a New York's, uh, anyway, won't mess that up. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so a lot of people do. You can, you can count the, the, you look at the size of it, you can just figure out how many fires have occurred, um, if it's been excavated correctly, so all these pits that we're talking about, and then you can figure out how many have been in there. Now, there's always a variable, right, because we we're, we're not going to know exactly how many times it was fired, but yeah, you can do that, for sure. If I were here tomorrow after her, I'd probably sound much more intelligent on that. So we do this also in conjunction with other things. We use mass spectrometry as well. Mass spec, I will say, is way more expensive. So an archaeological budget is not huge, um, unless you're a site like Chattelhoyak or something that you know, has a, a lot of uh, interest from other people, or sort of Herculaneum, the Villa of the Papyri. Hewlett Packard gives tons of money to the Villa of the Papyri. That would be fantastic, um, but mass spec costs a lot of money. But if you get, if you use your your budget correctly and you get a few key samples, because of course what mass spec is doing is giving you the exact chemical composition. So that's just going to give you a little bit more information. But again, bringing some of these older techniques in with the newer ones is um, is always something that I really like about archaeology. That you you need to you can't forget about the older stuff together with the newer. 
We also have obligations to the future. So we need to record this site. And what you're looking at here is a really, um, you might be thinking, wow, paper and pen. But what we start with out there in the field is a piece of paper called a context sheet that is going to tell us everything about the stratigraphic unit that we just excavated. Tell us about that soil. Tell us about the, that area, exactly. Everything from what units are around it to what the soil actually looked like. Was it clay? Was it, was it full of stone? Um, we even talk about what kind of weather was out there, <laughs> that top right corner. And that's because we want to know whether the, the excavator would have been able to see the soil correctly, if it was too wet, if it was too dry, if the sun, I mean, the, the most basic things can throw you off in archaeology sometimes. If it's very, very sunny and hot, the soil just gets baked and you can't actually see the soil changes. And you're really hoping for rain. And then you do, because you're in Northern England, it rains. And you get too much rain, and then you've got water everywhere. So there are, there are really basic things that, um, can throw you off a little bit. Um, but what we're striving for is a complete record of the site so that when somebody looks at this in 10 or 20 or 50 years, they can understand exactly what it was that we did. So we start with this context sheet. We have just rough sketches of what's happening. And what's really happening behind the scenes, so you know, there's people running around with uh, various t tools. What you've got here is a, is a total station. And that's how we get the plan. So I'm sure many of you have seen a total station or used a total station. We get the plan of the site. So we need to leave these basic records of what the building looked like, where exactly it was. This is going to be tied in precisely um, with, the, with the site, with the rest of the site, with the trig points. And luckily enough, since we're in England, we also know exactly where we are meters above sea level because we've got the ordnance survey trig point. So that's really handy as well. And we can see one actually right on top of this, this hill that's quite nearby. So. It's very handy to work at a in a place like England. So we build plans. We have full plans of the site. We also draw sections. Now, what's really cool, though, is that this stuff is becoming much, much easier now because we can do things like um, just you know, take, take a photograph and put it into Illustrator, put it into any kind of program now, and create our site plans and create our, our profiles. So what you're looking at here is a record of exactly what the profile of the trench looked like, of what we excavated, what kind of material. The one that would go into publication would have the um, context numbers on there, so we would know exactly what you have. You, you're looking at, um, you see these little uh, dashed lines right here. Those are marking the breaks in the context. So this just tells us exactly where each one of these contexts lay and how we removed it from the site. So these are the basic records that we leave. Lately, we've been coming up with a lot more interesting things that, um, that we can do with stuff. One is this 3D photo modeling, which is becoming really, really handy. And that's because it leaves us with a, a vision of exactly what these, it, these features looked like, exactly what the trench looked like. Because one thing that a lot of people don't think about is that this trench is located out in the middle of a farmer's field. And we have to backfill that. So actually, I think that it's backfilled right now. I think that last week, the farmer came out and backfilled it. Um, and, and one thing is that you can't leave kind of like a swimming pool. You can't leave a big giant hole in the ground. <laughs> they, don't, they don't like that. Um, it's actually illegal. It's, a, it's an English heritage. It's, it's a rule. It's a law that you have to fill these things back in. Um, unless you're going to consolidate them. You can't leave these large you know, trench edges if people are going to be walking through the field. And as you know, in England, there's lots of um, public uh, you know, right of ways, access, uh, what do they call it? Um, right to roam, so, which is great. It's fantastic. Um, but you can't leave these giant holes in the ground. So it has to be recorded to such a degree that you would be able to return to it. So what's been really great lately with 3D um, photo modeling is that we can, return, we can take an image of this exactly as it looked. And we can manipulate it. It's also really good for, for online journals and things as well. And we can manipulate it to be able to see anything, even looking underneath, to see exactly how much soil we took out, if we're interested in that. I'm not so interested in that. But it's really just a fantastic way of seeing exactly what the details. Now, what you're looking at here is really a, a basic. This is, um, I believe we used Agisoft to start with. This is actually a pretty basic. Sorry, let me come out again. A pretty basic program. We haven't done our sort of full scale program yet on here. But you can see how useful this really is to be able to get a vision of exactly how we left this feature. So all of you, you know, we take a million still photographs as well. 
But if we ever wanted to return to it and say, right, how did we leave that? We, we have that right here in front of us. It's also very handy for the entire trench. So at the end now, um, what we do is have this guy called, uh, he's from the Aerial Cam, I think his company is called. And he comes along in the middle of the season and at the end of every season, and he photographs the entire site, all of our trenches, everything that we've done. And he will do now 3D models for us as well. So we can see this doesn't look like much right here, but this is that one of these very important ditches that's going to date possibly, where, where we think it dates to a much uh, an earlier period. And we're hoping that the evidence that comes out of here will push the site back a little bit and be a part of an earlier frontier that, that we didn't know we were a part of before. So that would be really fantastic. But if there's any question later on, if we're saying to ourselves, okay, how did we leave that? You know, what did that look like? Because you think in, you know, on August 5th when you leave the site, you're going to remember everything, but of course you don't. And so we have these fantastic records of it right now. And this is all really just getting better and better and better. You know, we're not going to be out there with the total station at some point. We're just going to be out there with GPS and, you know, we need it to be to the centimeter is the issue. But these things are changing and becoming which is far more interesting um, over the next couple of years, over the next couple of decades. I can't even imagine where we're going to be in 20 years. So it's really fantastic. Um, also, what's really handy for us is these um, quadcopters. So I don't know, I kind of want to call it a drone, but I'm not going to call it a drone. It's a little quadcopter. Um, these can cruise around, so archaeologists are using this to really be able to get up above the site. Now, the other thing, though, it's not that terrible if you get a nice angled photograph, because these days we can just use sort of angle recognition software and get now, of course, the problem with archaeology is always affording this, but you can get a sort of angled image and then you can always just rectify it and be looking straight down. But you can also go out there and get a quadcopter and a GoPro and you can go right over your site and you get beautiful aerial shots of everything that, um, that, you, that you've, done, you've just excavated, really great PR pictures as well for, for marketing. And what you get, when you're down on the ground, you really sometimes can't see the forest for the trees. It's really difficult down there to actually see um, what's going on. When you hover up above it, and this is actually not from the quadcopter, this picture that you're looking at is just simply from a 40-foot pole that, that, um, that our guy Adam Stanford of Aerial Cam uses, goes up, takes the shot, and this is what it looks like. But you really just get this much, much greater sense of what the whole site looks like, of the rectilinear structures, of, of exactly what's going on in this, this trench that we, that we dug. This is um, one from inside of the fort. A couple of years ago, we did that from about 2009 to 12, around there. So some really interesting stuff going on. Now, at the same rate, though, the guy who has the, the quadcopter, he also has a kite that he sends up there with his camera on it, and he's got a remote. And you know, So there's all sorts of ways, of course, it can get really windy here on this site. So there's not many trees around, so it can be really problematic. But the, the, the quadcopter is really kind of a cool thing that archaeologists just generally are using um, around various areas. But I'm just going to leave you with saying that these things are all really interesting, and they give us so much information. But none of that is ever going to find a Vindolanda writing tablet. So that's why I make this real point that we really do need to use these new techniques with our old proven ways. Um, excavating, I don't think, is going to be actually getting out there with your trowel and your spade. It's never going to be superseded, I don't think. Um, plus, it's a lot of fun. Get to make mud patties, you know, wheelbarrows. There's nothing better than that. Fresh air all day. Um, so. That, all of this is fantastic. We get so much information and really just, it, it's just growing exponentially all the time with archaeology now. But we still need to get down there. We need to get dirty and we need to find more Vindolanda writing tablets and similar things like that. So that is, I think, where I'm going to leave you. Yes. Oh, do you want the, is it up here? No. Oh, right. When you were showing the magneto scans earlier, you said that sometimes you would find stone, uh, <coughs> like, stuff that didn't show up on the scan. Mm-hmm. Does the other way happen too? Like sometimes you see things on the scan and there's nothing there? Well, yeah, that's a really, really um, a, a good question because, yes, indeed. So, so like I said, um, we don't always find the stone structures that are there, um, but that's also because it just your ground soil 
matters. It's very important what, what's happening with your ground soil because, and, and also then what um, technique you choose. So what we're going to do this summer, we're still looking at all of our possibilities, but we probably won't maybe use magnetometer. We might use something else. Um, just because it's going to give you different readings, right? Um, what happens is not so much that there's nothing there, but it's not quite what you expected. So you might get a massive anomaly. There is iron does just sort of cluster. It leaches and clusters in the soil. It could just be natural there. And one time we did find just this massive, you, you, you can't even, you can't get through it, this massive clump of iron that was just a natural occurrence in the soil. Um, also, you'll notice, see all of these gray moving along the edge here? This is a road right here, the stain gate. That's a modern road and a modern field wall. And all of those readings, you get these really, really high readings along the edge. And that's simply people throwing tin cans and <laughs> you know, uh, relieving themselves <laughs> over the wall for a good couple of decades, uh, modern road works and things like that. So often what it is is that you find something <coughs> that you didn't necessarily need or a modern rubbish heap of some sort, an old wheelbarrow. That happens. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Can you briefly speak about some of the research you've been doing on the shoes? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things, so I said that those shoes are very close to my heart. Um, that is uh, something I could have given you an entire talk on shoes. Uh, but, um, okay, so we have over 4,000 shoes, and they are use, being used in all sorts of interesting ways. One way, what I'm interested in, is looking at who these shoes represent. Because if you can believe it, for decades and decades and decades, or centuries really, nobody was really thinking about who lived in these military forts, in these military communities, other than the soldiers. It was a very sort of misogynistic, very um, manly environment, the Roman army. Uh, and we never talked about the women who were there, the children. However, when these Vindolanda shoes popped up, a woman named Carol Vandrill Murray back in the early 90s, she started looking at certain contexts such as barrack blocks, so soldiers' barracks, and realizing that there are lots of children's and women's shoes in these spaces. Um, people always wanted this to be prostitutes and their children, I guess. And this is a real problem with research, right? We, we, this is not the way the world works. And so I started looking at who these shoes represented. Really cool stuff. There's children's and women's shoes all over the place. And then once I was bringing in other material as well, um, such as the documents that we mentioned, the inscriptions, the other things like that, um, realizing that women and children and families, in fact, are all over the Roman military environment. Um, I'm also hoping this summer, and this is another one of my collaborations, I'm hoping this summer to start doing DNA analysis on a lot of the leather. And now I, you can't ask me any more questions about that because I'm still researching and putting together my proposal because it's actually highly questionable what we'll be able to get out of Roman leather because of the tanning process, um, because of how long they've been sitting in the ground. So I'm still developing that plan, but I'm hoping to be able to understand where the, ta where the leather was coming from. So in other words, are they importing that from the continent? Is that, are they very, very local? Is it coming from the south? Kind of similar questions as the ceramics. Um, I am also looking at, I'm working and collaborating with a um, physical anthropologist in the anthropology department at Durham University in the UK, Dr. Trudy Buck. And we're looking at things like, um, this is mostly her department to be honest, but looking at things such as um, deformities in the population. So what are the shoes showing us? And in fact, when we look closely at these shoes, it is, they are showing us that the Romans had a sense of individual gait. They had a sense of the fact that they needed to fix things like high arches and pronation and supination. So we have shoes that have a metal, a metal bar on either the inside or the outer edge of a shoe. Really cool stuff. I could come back sometime and tell you, I talk an hour just about shoes. Um, so there's lots of really interesting stuff going on. Uh, maybe after I do this summer, it's going to be really interesting with, this, with testing, if I can um, get information out of this and get the right people on board. Somebody asked me if we could get any human DNA off of the leather, off of the shoes, just because people were wearing them, I guess maybe through sweat and things. And, and you know, I don't know. So I'm going to try to find out things like this. And if we can, wow, awesome. That would be really cool. Anyone have any input on that? <laughs> yes. Uh, it seems to me that the idea that the women were prostitutes mm -hmm. would be fantastically easy to, um, uh, to, to, to initiate get going, uh, you basically say, it's, it's, it's troops, women were there, probably prostitutes. Naturally. 
but exceptionally difficult to displace, to get rid of that idea yeah. once it's been established. Yeah. Um, so sort of like I used to have this tremendous argument in art history when I was in college, the Venus of Villendorf figures. Mm -hmm. I thought they were porn. The professors all said they were like fertility figures or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you know? Okay, the difference right. between porn and fertility. <coughs> so, so in a situation like this, where everybody has made the easy, easy leap to, oh, they must have been prostitutes, how do you go about the process of, of showing and demonstrating that they weren't prostitutes? Yeah, really interesting because um, one of the things you're bringing up is that surely there were prostitutes there. That's the thing. I mean, almost you know every human group, you have certain things that happen. You have women there. When you have women and men there, you have children there. And you also very often have prostitutes. And we know of prostitutes throughout the Roman world, throughout the Greek world, throughout pretty much any ancient society and modern. So that's an absolute fact of life. So it's basically trying, what you're asking is how do we pick apart what sort of social class or what sort of type of people we're talking about with these shoes. Now, one thing we can do is look at the archaeological context. So we have, or also tied into that, is looking at the type of shoe. Um, one of the shoes that I talk about a lot is called, it's called the Lepidina slipper because of where it's found. It's found in the house of the commanding officer. It's a very high-end shoe. It has the maker's marks throughout. It's something that we would like to say probably a prostitute wasn't able to afford and wasn't able to buy. But one of the points, though, about saying, OK, whether this is, whether this is the shoe of a prostitute or not, that's very difficult to say. That, and you can point to all these things. This is very high-end, et cetera, et cetera. It's very difficult to say exactly who, who wore that shoe. But the number now is so high that all of those individuals could not have been prostitutes. The other thing, what I do, coming from that cultural side that I said, with this classics background, I spent years and years and years reading ancient Greek and Latin. I'm not going to forget it, and I'm going to use it, is that we can look at the inscriptions, we can look at the documents that are left behind, and we can see in there that there are families in the Roman military. So I bring in the social aspect by looking at something particularly called the, the, um, sorry, the military diplomas, which are these bronze documents, they're discharge documents. And on those documents, they name the soldier at the bottom, and if he chose, he named his wife and his children, and those children got citizenship. And that, that's a family right there. That's not a prostitute. That, those are families right there. And therefore, we also know that those families were in the military environment. They were in these communities surrounding the army. I should have given my talk on this. This is, this is like my PhD research. Fantastic. Um, so we know that those people are there, and we just have to then be able to play. We can never in archaeology say this shoe was worn by this person. That's, that's not going to happen. Um, I suppose if they signed their name yeah, on every it. Every time I read National Geographic or anything about archaeology, people are always saying, this was a prostitute, this was a rich guy, this was a, this person, this was another. And yeah, we make, uh, we, make, we make educated guesses from the evidence that we have. Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, there are better and worse cases. You know, there are things where you're saying, yep, absolutely, that is definitely what, the, what looks like is happening there. Um, but I, I like to bring in all of the evidence, though. Bring in the documents. Bring in the archaeology. Look at the context of the find. Look at the actual find itself. There's a lot, there's a lot of angles you can take to be, to be pretty sure of what's happening. Yes, another question. Uh, so since you brought it up, uh, do we know much about what happens, or you mentioned like disability and injury. Mm -hmm. If you're not a senator or an equestrian or something, and you get injured as part of the Roman military, yep. do they have the equivalent of you know, the VA? Or was it um, the you're bigger now? No, we don't know of anything that is, let's say, like the VA. What we do have, we have military hospitals inside of a lot of these forts. There are very large ones at legionary forts. Um, the fort you're looking at here, Vindolanda, is an auxiliary fort. So that's actually a much smaller non-citizen unit that's living in this fort, um, anywhere between about 500 and 1,000 men nominally. How many are actually there? It's, it's around that. You know, you have... Um, you have cavalry units that are attached to it, so the number changes a little bit. Whereas a legion is technically... 5,000 and all sorts of people attached. So they have much larger hospitals in a legionary fort. And there is also evidence that soldiers remained in the settlements that were right next to the units, right next to the military fort. And to my mind, we don't have any written document that says, this is why I lived here. But there are, a lot, there are some soldiers that appear to go home, and we can kind of track their movements through epigraphy, through these inscriptions and things they've left behind. And a lot of people that tend to stay nearby, near the unit. And to my mind, it seems like you're staying near a familiarity for one, to, to, for, to one respect, in one respect, but then also that maybe you're still utilizing those military, um, you know, uh, 
goods and, 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 and services that you had when you were a soldier. But we don't really have anything written down that says exactly what happened or why they did this. Those wives you were talking about, were their names Roman or Celtic usually? Uh, Roman for the most part. So we don't really have, um, the, the soldiers though, th this is a really complicated, we could, we could, look, do you guys have another hour? We could go right into something. Um, those soldiers up at our site and on, on almost all of Hadrian's Wall are, unless you have vexillation units, we do have evidence that we do have legionary soldiers up there at some point. These are these auxiliary units that are being recruited from the conquered provinces of the Roman Empire and then often being shipped outside of their home area. So the units we have are called um, Tungrians for one, uh, Batavians. Tungrians are from modern name Belgium. Batavians are right around the area of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And so we have these sort of culture units, but then those became multicultural units in and of themselves because then they would be recruit from areas local, from areas that they were traveling, um, you know, from one place to another. So these became serious multicultural groups. So the names that we have, that we know of um, in our environment, um, you do get ones that are non-Roman, but you also have people that are taking Roman names because when they get Roman citizenship, they're taking Roman names. So it's sort of, it's, it's a bit of a mixture, but you can never always tell just a Roman name doesn't always mean that they weren't originally from somewhere else. Thank you.